Welcome to GRR Armory mid-range shooting series. Today we are gonna take a look at the uh, best low power variable optics available in the US market in 2018. We are gonna compare 30 options side by side. We are gonna do full specs comparison and we are gonna try to find out who are the top three choices for us. The brands included are Trigico, Nightforce, Kales, Leupold, SWFA, Steiner, Eotech, US Optics, Swarovski, Primary Arms, Vortex, Athlon, Leatherwood, Weaver, Boris and Bushnell. We also have an assortment of uh, choices between 1 to 4x, 1 to 5x, including also 1 to 6x and 1 to 8x. First, before we go into comparison, we should understand how much zoom do we need. And the question we have to ask ourselves is what are the realistic supersonic cartridge capabilities? This is for a tactical application with a 5.56 or 2.23 cartridge or with a 7.62 or 3.08. And let's start to look first at the 5.56 on the left side. And uh, you can see that uh, the probability of hit between 100 and 200 yards, it's roughly 100%. It's basically point and shoot depending on your zero however if we want to extend our range to three and four hundred yards this is where uh, the probability of hit goes down and therefore we need to be able to assess appropriately the distance and also we have to be able to appropriately account for wind otherwise we are not going to hit the target you can also see that at five and six hundred yards the probability of hits are already very low so therefore, a low power variable optic will enable us to operate in the range of 200 to 400 yards and occasionally stretch it further. As a note, beyond 400 yards, I don't use the 2 to 3, I switch to a 2 to 4 Valkyrie and this uh, gives you superior ballistics. However, beyond 400 yards, um, I prefer to use laser range finder to determine the distance to target. If we compare now the 30 caliber um, options, the range between 100 and 300 yards is basically green. We are able to um, hit our targets with minimal hold at 300 and we are able to extend our range and pro with good probability of hit between 400 and 600 yards. So if we want a low power variable optic, it should help us operate in the range of 3 to 600 yards and occasionally stretch it beyond. However, um, it's unlikely that we can get consistent hits to target beyond 600 yards. As a note, I uh, use 6.5 Creedmoor instead of uh, 308 in an AR-10 platform. However, combined with laser rangefinder and um, you need to calculate environmental specific ballistic solutions uh, beyond 600 yards. Let's talk a little bit about zoom and um, I have overlaid here in this picture an image um, with different uh, zoom ratios starting from 1x, 4x, 6x and 8x. They are all taken with the same scope in the same day and um, I'd like to convey to you that uh, there is a diminishing return in terms of gain of zoom for every 2x. Let me try to explain that. In the first step when you go from 1x to 2x you already bring the target closer uh, two times. So for example, a 600 yard target makes it look like a 300 with a 2x magnifier. When you bump it further to 4x, you already now make it look at, as if it were at 150 yards. So it's already in terms of bringing the target closer, so to speak, half of the improvement. As we go further to 6x, we stick with the same 600 yard target will now make it look as if it were at 100 yards. So we gain another 50 yards of closeness, if you will. And if we go from 6x to 8x, we gain only another 25. So therefore, um, while it may seem like a big jump from 6x to 8x is actually not that much. And therefore, if you have a, a scope already with 6x magnification, I don't think you should feel compelled to upgrade to 8x. Of course, if the target is far, very far away, beyond 600 yards, maybe at 800 or 1000, this is where it makes a little bit of a bigger difference. But nevertheless, I believe that the sweet spot today in the market, it's the 6x magnified variable optic. So a 1 to 6 is probably 
the sweet spot today. The next question we have to ask ourselves is do we need a first focal plane versus a second focal plane? Some may think of an FFP as an upgrade. And uh, does the answer change depending on magnification if we are at 4 or 6 or 8x? The difference between first focal plane and second focal plane you can easily see in these pictures. A second focal plane reticle always looks the same relative to your eye and the first focal plane reticle gets bigger as you zoom in to the target. In my opinion, uh, if you go for an 8x scope, I prefer a first focal plane. I'm not saying second focal plane, it's not a good option. It is, it might be for you. However, for me, I prefer first focal plane on the 1 to 8x. The reason is that otherwise, if you choose second focal plane, your reticle will stay true only at 8x magnification. And as we discussed earlier, we need to be able to use the reticle at different ranges. And therefore, for me to be forced into 8x to use the reticle appropriately, it's uh, not acceptable. And therefore, I would prefer a first focal plane in the 8x. When it comes to 6x, I could go either way. So uh, both are good options, in my opinion. And when we go to 4x, I believe second focal plane, it's uh, perfectly adequate. And actually, first focal plane in a 1 to 4x is a little uh, overkill, in my opinion. We selected the 30 low power variable optics for comparison. The application is a tactical semi-automatic rifle with a 1 to X power. We are requiring an illuminated dot or circle dot at 1X for a CQB, so for close engagements. And uh, we are looking for a bullet drop compensation for 600 plus yards or a mil or MOA reticle, depending on your preference in order to assess range, drop, and the wind. In the lowest uh, street prices we selected are about $300 and up, so therefore they are all good solid scope, they are uh, shockproof, waterproof, they hold zero, they track relatively well, so there is basically no bad scope in this selection, so they are all good solid scope. And we also included only some 1 to 4 and 1 to 5x for baselining, because as I said, I believe that the sweet spot is in the 1 to 6x in this market today. In the 1 to 8 for $500 and less, we have the Vortex Strike Eagle 1 to 8 by 24 and the Primary Arms 1 to 8 by 24, second focal plane, both of them. In the 6x category, we have the Athlon Midas BTR Gen 2. We have two Primary Arms, 1 to 6, one FFP, one SFP and they have a Vortex Strike Eagle 1 to 6. In the 1 to 5, we included the Weaver Tactical 1 to 5 in the first focal plane, and the Burris XTR 2 second focal plane. And in the 4X, we picked the Steiner P4XI and the Bushnell AR Optic 1 to 4. The Bushnell is in the first focal plane, Steiner is in the second focal plane. In the next category going up, we have now a, a group of scopes that are under $1,000 and the focus, as I mentioned earlier, it's in the 1 to 6 and 1 to 8, where I picked two or more for every $500 price band, both FFP and SFP. So looking at 8x, we have a Burris XTR 1 to 8, second focal plane under $1,000, and then a Leatherwood 1 to 8 by 26 in a first focal plane. And if we look at the 6x, this is where the sweet spot is. We have uh, five choices, starting with the Vortex Viper PST Gen 2, moving to the 3G Con AccuPoint 1 to 6. Next up, we have 6 hour Tango 6 1 to 6 in a first focal plane, SWFA SSHD 1 to 6 FFP, and then a Eotech Voodoo 1 to 6 FFP as well. In the next category up, with street prices under $1,500, um, it's the target upper limit for our uh, scopes today. And um, I would like to also mention that in their category, they are all good choices. So in general, there is no bad scope on this list and they have been picked in their category because they uh, fit most of the criteria we are looking for. Starting with the 8X, we pick the Primary Arms 1 to 8 ACSS Platinum, the 3G Con Power 1 to 8, and then we have a Boris XTR 2 in first focal plane, 
And if we go to the 6X, uh, under $1,500, we have the Leupold VX6HD Multigun, followed by US Optics 126 SVS. We picked the Athlon Kronos BTR 126 in this category as well. And next, the Vortex Razor HD Gen 2 or Gen 2E, in this case, the newer option, which is a bit lighter weight. I also included some top tier options for a features benchmark. Although they are more than $1,500, I believe that we should understand what's in the upmarket and um, also assess if they uh, somehow justify their prices based on the features. However, if money is no object, uh, definitely they are all good choices. Going at the top, we have the Night Force Attacker 128. In the first focal plane, we have a Swarovski 128 um, Z8i. This actually is in the second focal plane. And then we have also a Night Force NX8 128 in the first focal plane. In the high price category for the 6X, we have the Leupold Mark 6 126 FFP and then the Kales K69 126 SFP. And I also listed here a Steiner T5XI because I believe it's trying to compete uh, not with the 1 to 4s and 1 to 5s, but actually it's in this upper range, so under $1,500. So um, I listed it up there with the Kales and Leupold. Also, I have not included all manufacturers, brands or models. There are other options in the market. So if your favorite one is not included, I'm sorry. Um, however, by the end of this presentation, you will be able to assess uh, all the different specs and options and make up your own judgment regarding any low power variable optic you might be interested in. I also will make available the Excel list behind so you can download it, use it, modify it um, and use it however you would like. As a note, um, I also have compared the luminosity, the intensity for the 1x to the aim point. You know, people say is it aim point bright? So I looked, I have an A point, I have two actually. And I compared the, the 1x intensity to the aim point. So let's talk about the method used to compare these uh, 30 low power variable optics. I have done the evaluation and comparison during 2018. I have not done any extra durability tests, so only normal recoil. And the method uh, is using the baseline, which is a uh, Virtual scope 1 to 6 by 24 second focal plane, roughly 10.5 inches in length, roughly 20 ounces in weight, field of view about 110 feet at 100 yards, with half MOA clicks, with a BDC or mill illuminating reticle, with good glass and good warranty for about $500. So the criteria were scored relative to this average scope, so to speak. And therefore, they could either add get points or get points subtracted as it relates to the relative size or length and weight, the field of view and exit pupil, the zoom ratio, so versatility of the scope, eye relief and eye box forgiveness, um, the reticle type, whether it's first focal plane or second focal plane, and the reticle features. I also scored the illumination intensity and the battery the zero adjustment range and precision of the clicks and then um, towards the end the glass quality and durability or the brand perceived durability and then finally the warranty including the warranty for electronics realistically um, a scope can get up to 10 points because some of these uh, characteristics uh, are actually opposite to each other so therefore um, realistically 10 points is the maximum from all those scopes that I got today. So um, I look at value which is very important for me in two ways. One is the relative value where I divide the street price by the net total points. So how much you pay for the net of the spec points. And then secondly I did a calculation whereby the expected price for a scope it's the baseline the $500 plus $100 for every point on top. So therefore, a maximum price expected would be about $1,500 if the maximum number of points is 10. 
So I will uh, present all these scopes in the same order till the end of the presentation where I will show the final ranking to help you watch this video and if you have one preferred scope it will always be in the same relative position on the screen so I'm not gonna sort them all the time because I think it might drive you nuts. So if we take just as an example the Night Force Attacker 1 to 8, it's a 24mm objective. If we look, the Trigicon Occupower stands out with 28 and I gave it an extra point. So green means a plus one, red means a minus one. So they got an extra point for the objective size because I believe it's gonna help gather a lot of light, especially in the low light situation. And also when you look through it, um, it's actually a very pleasant picture. So the Leatherwood with 26 is just different, slightly different, and the Leopold Mark 6 with 20 is slightly lower. I did not deduct it points for it. In terms of tube size, majority are 30 millimeters. I marked in yellow the 34 because you will need a different mount. As far as the length, if they are around 10 inches or less, I gave them a green, and then if they are longer, I just made a note. The longest one in this list, it's actually the Swarovski 1 to 8, and then also the Boris XTR2 1 to 5. It's uh, pretty long relative to what it can do. In terms of weight, if they are uh, 17 ounces or less, I gave them a green. And if they are uh, in the 24, 25, 26 ounces, I deduct the point. Because I believe weight is also important, at least for me, and therefore a good lightweight package while still being durable, it's a desirable choice. In terms of the relative indices, on the weight side especially, I uh, created a calculation that says for every extra zoom, one X of zoom, how many ounces above the baseline of 12 ounces does the scope bring? And therefore you can see that at the bottom the XTR2, the P4XI and the AR Optic they are all relatively heavy and they are only 4x or 5x respectively so therefore there is a lot of weight for not a lot of zoom. Next up we are going to compare the exit pupil field of view and um, zoom ratio. I have uh, listed uh, the numbers for 1x, 4x, 6x and maximum. Maximum depends by scope. And um, you can see in the field of view at 100 yards the Swarovski, the Leatherwood, Vortex, also Kales. The ones in green are offering above average field of view and I dinged only two of them with a minus one point, the Attacker 1 to 8 and the SWFASS because their field of view is actually significantly lower than the average. Exit pupil, it's, the, it's calculated by dividing the objective size to the magnification. And uh, higher is better, especially in a low light situation. And um, I have uh, marked the ones that are actually higher versus lower. In terms of zoom ratios, I uh, gave an extra point for the 1 to 8s. And I deduct the point for everything below 1 to 6. So 1 to 6 being the baseline. So if it's a 1 to 4 and 1 to 5, it got one point of deduction. Next up, we are going to look at the eye relief. If it's a good eye relief, about 4 inches or thereabout, I gave an extra point. If it's more around 3.5, 3.7, I did not. In terms of the reticle type, I gave an one point for the first focal plane because I believe in general this is a desirable feature. Again, if you don't need it, that's fine. But in terms of uh, also manufacturing the scope, it's a bit more complicated, so therefore it also costs more in general. However, I deducted uh, one point for the second focal plane only when it comes to the one to eight options. And as I explained earlier, for me in the 1 to 8 second focal plane is not adequate and therefore they got dinged one point. In terms of um, the 1x features and the reticles, um, majority of them have a combination of a dot or a circle dot with mills or BDC. And here I gave an extra point to all the primary arms with the ACSS reticle. I think it's one of the best choices available in the market. In terms of intensity, I gave um, some extra points for uh, special features to mode, for example, in the Swarovski. Um, there is a 
dial feature for the colors so it's a continuous uh, intensity and not discrete so not with uh, steps however i also marked in green the ones that in my opinion are uh, the best closest to aim point bright so to speak so they are the best of the best uh, however if it says daylight is definitely usable but if it's a daylight in green it means it's really really good also i uh, dinged two of them the weaver tactical one to five and the bushnell one to four ar optic because in my mind the illumination is very weak the intensity is weak and uh, as far as the application i'm looking for are not adequate so they got deducted one point in terms of uh, battery and other features majority are the cr2032 however the steiner t5xi is the cr2450 no idea why they picked this battery it's kind of a odd one so it might be harder to find so i think them one for that and i gave extra points for the motion activated ones so the leupold vx6 the six hour tango 6 and the eotech voodoo eotech voodoo has auto off and then um, also the trigicon acupoint has the tritium option so for low light engagements um, it has an extra feature so they got the point there in terms of the bdc wind or range features of the reticles for use in the mid-range engagement i gave some extra points to the ones that offer more combination of range and wind for example and uh, the only one I gave, I deducted one point from was the Leatherwood 1 to 8, which you might like it, but for me it was an extremely busy reticle with a lot of stuff going on. In terms of the windage elevation and range for zero, for this particular scope is not that important because once we set the zero, we probably won't touch it too much. And uh, in terms of clicks, I gave an extra point for the 0.1 or a quarter MOA clicks and uh, i just highlighted the other ones which are twice the precision i don't think it's a big deal but in terms of manufacturing and precision you pay a little more in terms of capped and locked turrets i gave some uh, extra point for those that offer uh, more than the normal ones so for example the swarovski the boris they are offering um, also bullet drop compensator and um, on the night force and x8 only the windage is capped the elevation it's not and um, as far as zero stop i don't think it's that important because we don't dial too much but i also list it if it's a yes or a no parallax for all of these low power variable optics is fixed next up we are going to compare the glass quality and the durability and the warranty and also i'm bringing here the street price so you have the category the maximum price on the left but in the middle of the screen you see the street price these are prices roughly as of december 2018 plus minus a hundred dollars plus minus ten percent i have to make a couple of notes here first the steiner t5 xi it's uh, fairly expensive for the one to five the razor hd gen 2 e it's fourteen hundred dollars However, you can find now the Gen 2, which is uh, about 4 ounces heavier, but for much less, for around um, 1100 or 1000 So I didn't want to list all of the options, but just keep that in mind. If 1400 is too much, you can uh, go for the Gen 2 with a weight penalty, but save $300 at least. And then finally, the 6-hour Tango 6. I struggled a lot with them because their prices is all over the board. You can find both first focal plane and second focal plane from $900, $1,000 up to $1,300, $1,400, $1,500. So I have no idea what's going on. I chose to list them up to $1,000 because I believe if you can get your hands on one around $1,000, it's actually a very good choice. In terms of glass quality, as I mentioned, the baseline is a good or very good glass for around $500 or higher. And therefore the ones that are in the three to four hundred dollars they got dinged one it doesn't mean that they are not doing the job they will all do a good job with normal lighting conditions and uh, they are all adequate but definitely um, you can get better glass for slightly more money therefore um, in the b category um, are the ones roughly between 500 and a thousand dollars options 
A's are starting to come in around at a thousand dollar. Double A also in the same price range, pushing fifteen hundred. And then normally, when you go above two thousand dollars or so, you get the best of the best glass quality. I call it triple A. Now I have to mention that assessing glass, it's a bit of a personal assessment. There is a bit of an art of putting a scope together. It takes a lot of uh, science on one hand and um, it takes a lot of engineering to combine the right glass type with the right lens um, curvature to put the right coating and um, therefore you do indeed get something better as you pay. However, at some point there is a diminishing return and um, you will see later on a $1,500 scope has a really good glass and then the $2,500, yes, it might be slightly better, but it's questionable if it's uh, worth a thousand dollars more. Nevertheless, um, this is my assessment. Your mileage may vary. You may have a different opinion. So again, uh, if you have a different uh, rating, please adjust it accordingly and do your own judgment. In terms of brand and durability, I gave uh, an A to those that have a solid track record, either military use or uh, definitely competition, very good uh, track record, as I said before and all the other ones I gave B. So again, if your capabilities do not require A and you are happy with the B, they are perfectly fine. I would have no problem in uh, non-field of operations, military conditions to use any of the Bs. In terms of warranty, the story gets a little bit interesting. I have um, a few companies that offer an extremely good warranty. Of course, Vortex is the first one in this case. However, Leupold is not too far behind. And then this new entry, Athlon company, are also uh, mimicking the Vortex warranty style. So I gave them an extra point. And um, what you have to be careful is that uh, while they give, many companies give a scope warranty, could be a lifetime, they have a so-called electronic components sub-warranty. And um, I actually contacted all of them to understand how does the electronic component warranty apply to a low power variable optic. And you get some surprises because, for example, uh, on the AccuPower, this is only five years. So, um, hey, five years is good enough for you. That's fine, but I ding them one point there. Uh, the leather with its only two years for electronic components. The EOTech, it's also only two years for electronic components. And um, also the Weaver Tactical, it's even worse, so it's one year for the electronic components. So for the other ones, uh, which are uh, in yellow, there is an electronic comp warranty, but um, it's not applicable in case of low power variable optics. I had that confirmed by the customer service for each company. If we now um, tally up the total and we add uh, all the green points that the scopes got, you have the green score total. We add all the deductions, all the red scores, and we get the total score. And as I mentioned before, I calculated the value price per point. So in the first case, as an example, you have $2,700 street price divided by 7, the total score, and rounded to the nearest tens, you get 390 and uh, we will uh, judge if it's good value or not good value in the minutes to come. So another way to look at it, as I mentioned before, it's to take all the number of points, add it to a baseline of 500 and see how much would be the expected price. So on the right side, you see that uh, for attacker with this math, you sh an attacker should cost $1,200, but it costs $2,700. So basically it's more than double then I believe it's a cost plus um, estimate for how much it should be. So you can see for all of them how much is the value delta between the street price and the expected price. Of course, all the scopes that are in the three, four, five hundred dollars offer a lot. So they are good value. Many of them you can see are uh, within plus minus two hundred dollars. However, you start to see where you are paying either for the brand name 
or for the glass, but in my mind excessively. And um, you can make your own judgment from this picture as well. So let's put it all together now with the start with the first round value identifying the top 12. So we took everything that has a $200 or less per point and we gave them a win. Anything between uh, higher than 200 and up to 300 got a lost, a yellow, and everything above 300 got a red. So you can see how the first two in terms of value are goodbye and the other ones are either win winners or losers in this value round. However, we also have to look at the specs. So we compare now based on the total score, all the choices and we gave a win to the top 12 and we gave a loss to everybody else. Next, I have put together the value and the specs and came up with my uh, top 12. I call this the group round, like in uh, sports, soccer, for example. So here you find the top 12 options and um, we have the Night Force and X8, the Primary Arms Platinum, the Trigicon Power in the first group, the Boris XTR2 SFP and the Leatherwood, these are still 1 to 8. And I go now to 1 to 6s. I have the Leopold VX6, the Vortex Razor HD Gen 2, the Vortex Viper PST Gen 2, the 6 hour Tango 6. As winners, when you go to the value category, I have the Primary Arms 1 to 6 FFP. And then when I go to 1 to 5, the Boris XTR 2 1 to 5, and then the Steiner P4 XI. These are all the winning, so these are the top 12 scopes in my opinion out of this list. If we now further pare it down out of this top 12, which ones are the top 6? The IQ power dropped but the NX8 and the primary and platinum stayed. The VX6 moved forward, the Razor HD moved forward, the PST Gen 2 moved forward as well and then finally at the bottom the Steiner P4 XI moved forward so they offer in my mind either better value or better specs or a better combination. These are the top 6 out of the top 12. To further select the top 3, I compared and contrasted the different top 6 options and um, I picked the NX8 versus the primary arms. Primarily it's because of the weight, the NX8 is a very lightweight, the primary arms platinum it's heavy, however they are both very good choices. In terms of the 1 to 6 is the Leopold VX6. It's also lightweight, fully loaded with features. And then the Razor HD Gen 2 E. Um, it's also heavier weight, but also an excellent choice. So I picked the Leopold VX6 over the Razor HD. And then in the value category, I picked the Steiner P4 XI. It's for $500. Excellent choice, amazing glass, and um, it took the win versus the Vortex Viper PST Gen 2 1 to 6. However, the PST Gen 2 1 to 6, it's an excellent choice. It's half of the price of the Razor HD. Not the same glass quality, but very similar options. Doesn't have a BBC reticle, but it has a new reticle. So um, I really like the PST Gen 2 for a value option around. $700. So if we relist now or we resort the entire list, we see the top three, then the places four, five, and six, and then further the list to 12, the list to 22, and then at the bottom, those that primarily uh, failed in the value category when it comes to the strip price versus the total score. So here is our podium and the uh, Number one place is the Leopold VX6 HD Multigun, the Night Force um, 128 FFP got the second place, and then the third place, the Steiner P4 XI. And if we go uh, to continue the places 4, 5, and 6, the Razor HD Gen 2, fourth place, fifth place, the Primary Arms Platinum 128 FFP. And then in the sixth place, the Vortex Viper PST Gen 2. The top three choices are lightweight. The next three places are heavier weight. 
So thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it and it will help you make your own choice as far as low power variable optics. And uh, please stay safe, comment, subscribe and share. I would like to uh, continue by using the Excel spreadsheet to show you how we went about different um, rankings. If we start with the objective size, you can see at the higher level the AccuPower and the Leatherwood. I gave an extra point to AccuPower for the great objective size and light gathering capabilities and a word of caution to the Leupold Mark VI. Um, it's only a 20 millimeter objective. It's good, but uh, definitely the other ones are slightly better. In terms of tube size, the 34 millimeters may pose a bit of a challenge to find the exact mount you want, but there are good options out there. In terms of length, we gave the green points to all of those around 10 inches or less, and uh, put a yellow uh, caution to the other ones. In terms of weight, you can see the lightest one was actually the Weaver in the 1 to 5, but in the 1 to 6, the Leupold VX6 with 15.6 ounces, it's very good. In terms of the ratio of uh, weight versus zoom, if somebody it's low and it didn't get a green on the absolute weight, it got a green on this one, so the primary arms 1 to 8 got the extra point. And this is where, the, unfortunately, at the bottom, you have a lot of weight for only a 1 to 4 and 1 to 5. In terms of field of view, we have some amazing choices. Varovsky and Kales, these are the sister companies from Europe. They definitely stand out. So when they say great field of view, they actually mean it. And then um, you can see the other ones uh, getting lower and with a special note at the bottom for the attacker 1 to 8 and the SWFH T1 to 6. In terms of exit pupil, you will see the obviously the 1 to 4s by 24 have a large exit pupil and at the bottom um, we find all the 1 to 8s by 24. If we compare the eye relief, I mentioned it already, in terms of SFP, FFP, I gave a green to all the FFPs and the red only to the SFPs in the 1 to 8. In terms of street price, so you find at the top all the premium top tier scopes, the Steiner I marked in red because uh, again for a 1 to 5 I think it's a fairly expensive choice and the 6 hour price in Tango 6 it's all over the map so I really think they need to get their act together in pricing. In terms of uh, glass quality, you see all the A's leading up to the triple A. The B's are the very good options in the middle. And then the C's I gave actually for those that uh, I think are one grade below what you can buy in the five to seven hundred dollar range. In terms of uh, brand and durability, I gave A's to all of those that have uh, either a military background or a proven track record and then B's for everybody else. Because as I mentioned before, all those scopes are durable for normal civilian use. In terms of green scores, at the top we have the Leupold VX6 HD and then uh, a whole series of premium scopes following it. and. Um, in terms of total score, it's a fairly similar picture. If we compare now the value point, if we sort ascending by value, you see where we found our top 12 choices. So pretty much everything $200 and less per point, it's in our value group. Moving next to the specs, if I sort descending by specs, we find the next top 12 by specs and then uh, if I uh, put it all together combination of value and specs these are my top 12 choices and um, you see many of them scored both value and specs and definitely they are winners other ones are either very good value with good specs or very good specs with relatively good value 
if we move to the top six we uh, have now the cream of the crop coming up these are definitely my top six choices out of this list but uh, the second six are also very good so uh, depending on your application you might choose one or the other and then finally if we sort by the final ranking we'll find also our top three choices so the VX6 HD, the MX8 and the Steiner P4XI and following closely the Razer HD, the Primary Arms Platinum and the Viper PST Gen 2. If we now compare to the total value based on the street price, let's sort by expected, expected price. So my expectation is no scope should cost more than $1500 and the only one that has a lot of features and is priced well is the Lupo VX6 HD. Many other ones have the features but they are priced way above. And um, of course at the bottom to some extent we find um, the expected price in the 500 and up but if we now sort as value you will see that many of the scopes have offered a lot of good value and um, however there are some where you pay for extra glass quality, extra durability, brand name, military heritage, cool factor. So it's up to you to choose uh, how much money you want to spend. The Night Force NX8 1 to 8 by 24 FFP. You can see it has a very bright reticle. It's in the first focal plane and the reticle is uh, growing as you zoom in. It's a mill reticle, but it has a circle dot, so um, it's a very good choice. It's a lightweight and uh, it took a place on the podium. The primary arms, platinum, 1 to 8, FFP, ACSS reticle. It's also a great scope, first focal plane. You can see the reticle growing as you zoom in. Also, please don't compare the pictures and try to assess glass quality from it because these are taken with an iPhone through a scope. The exposure is not always locked in the same way. The weather is changing, the light is changing outside. I didn't take all the pictures exactly at the same time. So uh, please don't judge glass quality from these pictures. In terms of uh, brightness, also very good brightness for the primary arms platinum. The Trigicon AccuPower 1 to 8. Uh, it has a mil FFP reticle, the model I chose. I really enjoy the image. It has a 28 millimeter objective. Somehow it, uh, it looks very good when you look through it. And um, the only downside from my side is it's heavy and it doesn't have a bullet drop compensator, but it's definitely an excellent choice. The Kales 1 to 6 K16i, it's one of these top tiers, $2,000 or so, um, European glass optics. Kales, it's a very old manufacturer from Austria. It's actually a sister company of Swarovski. And um, it's a definitely beautiful glass, great features. It's an excellent choice on the expensive side. So if you can afford it, you won't regret it. In terms of uh, intensity of the dot, it's not the best out there, but it's definitely usable. It actually it has two dots illuminated. The Leupold VX6 HD, it's the number one scope on this list, in my opinion. Is definitely loaded with features. It has a very good reticle bullet drop compensation. It has a good uh, intensity. It's not the, the most uh, brightest. It's not the brightest uh, circle dot out there. However, it's very good. Um, a bit of a pain in the butt is the way uh, you change the intensity. is a push button model. Okay, you can get over it. It's a matter of training. Um, but in the end, in my mind, it offers the best. It's lightweight 
and uh, definitely very good glass so if I could have only one low power variable optic this is the one I would choose. The Vortex uh, Razor HD Gen 2E or Gen 2 for the slightly heavier one is an excellent choice 1 to 6 by 24 proven in 3 gun it has an amazing thin uh, outer edge as you look through it so it almost disappears into the background at 1x when you shoot with both eyes open very bright dot in the middle and the GM1 BDC reticle it's also excellent for determining range and drops so an excellent excellent choice glass very good so definitely a great option I would also encourage you to look for a Gen 2 only if you can carry the extra 4 ounces because you will find them with the GM1 reticle around $1000 now now that the Gen 2 is out also the Vortex VIP warranty it's the best in the business no question asked they will take care of you if you can't afford, afford the thousand or fourteen hundred dollars for the Razor HD I recommend the Viper PST Gen 2 1 to 6 by 24 it's a new option for 2018 it offers a similar good picture an excellent bright dot the only downside is that it doesn't necessarily have a bullet drop compensation reticle it has the VMR2 MRAD so a mill reticle but um, I believe it's a very good choice, slightly on the heavier side, over uh, 20 ounces compared to other options out there. Nevertheless, a great choice. The glass it's good, it's not as good as the Rager HD, but it's definitely good and better than many other choices under $500. So highly recommend it, check it out. The Steiner P4XI. It's an amazing entry for about $500. It offers excellent glass. It's a German European manufacturer with military heritage and it has a super bright red dot in the middle. It has a great reticle, bullet drop compensation ranging one to four, perfectly adequate. So definitely I encourage you to check it out. It's also relatively lightweight so if you only have $500 to spend I would say look at it it might be better than primary arms or Athlon or uh, some entry-level vortex choices in the market